You're listening to audio from the Village Church, a community that's formed by the gospel and sent on God's mission, gathering weekly in the heart of downtown Hamilton, Ohio. For more information about the Village or to connect with us, you can find us online at myvillagechurch.com. Join me in reading the focal passage this morning. It's Micah chapter 4, verses 6 through 13. Uh, The word should be on the screen, where you can follow along there as well. Verse 6, In that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather those who have been driven away, and those whom I have afflicted. And the lame I will make the remnant, and those who are cast off a strong nation. And the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from this time forth and forevermore. And you, O tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come. The former dominion shall come, kingship for the daughter of Jerusalem. Now why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in you? Has your counselor perished, that pain sees you like a woman in labor? Writhe and groan, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in labor. For now you shall go out from the city and dwell in the open country. You shall go to Babylon. There you shall be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. Now many nations are assembled against you, saying, Let her be defiled, and let our eyes gaze upon Zion. But they do not know the thoughts of the Lord. They do not understand his plan, that he has gathered them as sheaves to the threshing floor. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make your horn iron, and I will make your hooves bronze. You shall beat in pieces many peoples, and shall devote their gain to the Lord, their wealth to the Lord of the whole earth. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Uh, Hey, all. My name is Mike. I'm one of the pastors here. Thanks so much for hanging out with us. Uh, We're going to get to that passage in Micah in just a few minutes. I I first just want to open up with uh, reading Revelation 21, verses 1 through 5. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven... And the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. There is coming a time when all things will be made new, and the people of God will be with God perfectly in harmony with one another, in harmony with God, the creator of all things, in harmony with creation, with, with no pain and no fear and no anxiety and no toil within us and no tears and no divide and no, no tense election seasons with, uh, with uh, days of division, no abusive power, no oppressive leadership, no war among the nations, no war among the neighborhoods, no war among brother and sister, no society fracture, no disunity, no more pain forever. Can you imagine? Because I know sometimes when I read this future hope, it's really difficult to imagine that. But we're not there yet. This is not the reality that we live in here and now. Sin breaks things, and that makes life difficult. Uh, me personally, when I watch you know, uh, news streams or, or scroll through news feeds, and I see things that, that are painful, personal uh, stories, or, or even, even bigger picture stuff, 
my heart wants to turn away and my heart wants to continue scrolling and my mind wants to wince and act like that doesn't exist. And I know what's happening inside of me and inside of my brain, inside of my heart is, is that is me coping with not supposed to be. Things that are not supposed to be that way. But sin, it doesn't only break things out there. Sin breaks things in here. And that is a problem. That is our problem. That is the human problem that we are broken. That community is broken. That creation is broken. And and that isn't even the whole story. Because of sin, specifically because of our sin, personal against God, we incur a, a debt against him. He is perfect. And as we've been journeying through this, we see that he is just, and his creation was perfect. And it was ideal and suited for us to be his and for him to be ours. But we, all of humanity that have ever lived minus one, we, we break that. We contribute to brokenness. And God must deal with us justly. We see this in the way that God interacts with his people. Uh, and we see in this series, Micah, Justice for All, and we're, we're uh, coming on four chapters in, and, and, and we've seen the prophet speaking to God's people in the 8th century B.C., a long time ago, 2,700 years ago. And, and by the Spirit, God continues to use his words to speak to us today. And Micah has been pronouncing judgment against God's people for their idolatry, for them replacing the one true God with with all sorts of other false gods, and and, and for his judgment against them for being power hungry and and corrupt and, and, and breaking the weak, all things that the world might be known for. And and now what we see in God's people is that those things have taken root at home. And this segues us into a twofold tension that kind of parallel lines that we have to read as we try to make heads or tails of this chapter. And, and the two things are this, that sin brings pain because it cuts against uh, human flourishing. That's what sin does. God created everything good, and he created humanity and creation to function in harmony and to flourish as we lived under his rule and, and in his presence. Sin cuts that. So it cuts the legs out of the perfect creation that God created. And and the second is this. Judgment brings pain. Because God is just, his justice demands it. So for us to alienate God is to heap judgment. The big idea of this is, is God's people will endure pain. But through the pain is the hope of God's plan. God's people, for those who are in Christ, those who put the hope of their life and death in the work that Jesus has already accomplished for us, God's people have hope that triumphs all other hope. And those, those who are not God's people, and those who don't walk with him, they don't have hope that triumphs all other hope. For those who are in Christ, the good that we see in this life, the the good things are just a sliver of what's to come. When you see a a beautiful landscape and you take it in, or if you have butterflies at the beginning of a a new relationship, or if uh, if you get to drive in the snow, which is one of the great glories of life, right? Music that grips your heart. Uh, For some of you, maybe in an organized closet or a balanced budget, whatever it is that you look at and you say, yes, mangoes, mangoes. A.J. Swoboda says this. He says, once when sharing my faith with an agnostic friend, I was asked to make my greatest argument for God's existence. This isn't it, by the way, but this is what he says. He says, I uttered one word, mangoes. 
I was not talking about just any mangoes. I was talking about fresh, ripe, just off the tree mangoes. About have to change your shirt afterward mangoes. Mangoes, I explained, were my greatest argument for God's existence. To this day, I cannot eat a mango and say with a straight face that this is a world that was invented by a jerk. Or that something so delicious could come from nowhere. Creation is good. Why? Because God is good. And his goodness is reflected in what he makes. A mango, as part of creation, is God's love letter to humanity. Is that the way you look at the slivers of good? But here's the thing, for those who are in Christ, those, those slivers of good are, are just fractions of the, of the goodness that is to come. And the inverse of that is true for those not in Christ. The bad that we feel, that we experience, that we endure, that, that we suffer, all of those things are but a sliver of the greater pain that is to come in the judgment from God for our sin. Both of those things we get to pay attention to, and certainly as we look at this text today, in, in the, the scope, remember the hearer that heard these words initially were God's people. So, so these, the, this hope uh, storyline is for, for the hope of those who are God's people, for us, those who put their hope in Jesus. The first point is this, I, uh, I'm sorry, point number one, hope cuts through judgment. So we're looking at Micah chapter 4, starting in verse 6. With this in mind, hope cuts through judgment. In that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather those who have been driven away. And those whom I have afflicted and the lame, I will make the remnant. And those who are cast off a strong nation, And the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from this time forth and forevermore. And you, O tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come. The former dominion shall come, kingship for the daughter of Zion. Jerusalem. There's all kinds of stuff in there. When we talk of Zion, we're talking of of God's holy city, okay? And so we just have to keep this in mind. What he's saying is, is in that day, sometime in the future when history unfolds, be it near or be it far or be it both. See, theologians tell us when we read Uh, prophecy of old in the Old Testament, and even unfulfilled stuff in the New Testament, things about uh, times that that didn't exist when the prophets spoke them. Um, They tell us that, that an analogy to use is a mountain range. And as the prophet speaks, he's talking about things, and, and they, they don't know when that's going to happen. And so as they look ahead at these things, they see uh, a mountain and another mountain that looks adjacent and, a, and another mountain. And it looks like one, one cluster of mountains, but if we were to pan around 90 degrees and look at that same mountain range, man, there might be miles between those mountains. And so Micah doesn't know when these things are happening. He, he's pronouncing the judgment, uh, the words of God to God's people. And so we get to look at these and we get to say, man, did did these things happen? Are these things yet to happen? And I think the answer is is yes. Both are true that there is partial fulfillment in Micah's words and and, uh, some of the stuff he he points to, Babylon and and other things in in, uh, as uh, Assyria comes and rolls over the north and Babylon comes and sacks the southern kingdom, Judah and Jerusalem. Later on, uh, another Uh, empire, the Persians, they would come and they would overtake the Babylonians. And in that, they would allow God's people freedom to rebuild a temple, to worship God, even under Persian rule. But but all of this certainly points us to greater fulfillment that, that we'll unpack over the next few weeks. This mountain language, when we hear words like we read in this text, about mountains. It's not just a beautiful landscape. Hills were not just some, some uh, beautiful perspective that the prophet was talking about. When, when the Bible talks about mountains, it's where God rules and it's where God dwells. 
right? It's not just beauty of the mountains, but it's always connected with God's reign and God's presence. So when we look at this and we backtrack and we begin in in the beginning of chapter 4, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains. This mountain where God reigns, will be taller than all the other mountains. And his reign will extend far beyond any of the other rulers of the earth. And it shall be lifted up above the hills and people shall flow to it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and on and on. And so when we get to verse 8, And you, O tower of the flock, Hill of the daughter of Zion, you shall come, uh, you, you, to you shall it come. The former dominion shall come, kingship for the daughter of Jerusalem. Israel had the same problem that we have. God's people had the same problem that we have today. They're looking to this former dominion, this, this previous king that will come. They had the the glory days syndrome. Um, it's, it's really the same thing that we see in our culture today. It's uh, w- whether this is embellished truth or not, they look back to when David ruled and they said, yes, that's when we were mighty. And for us, you can see it in, in our conscience, in our collective culture, when we, when we say things like make America great again. And to be clear, remember, uh, Israel and America are not one in the same, all right? We are a people scattered as the church. We, we are not a nation like we see with borders. We, we are uh, throughout the whole world, right? But, but when we see that, it's, it's pointing back to a time that has gone by. Make us great again. So, so they have the same syndrome that we have. And, and what, what God is doing through Micah is he's pointing them to remember the good days. And remember when, when God ruled and the kingdom wasn't divided and David ruled with, with, a, with a mighty hand. And for a sliver of time, it was, it was good. It was the good life. That's the hope that Micah points them to. And, and in the midst of judgment for the wickedness of Israel and, and Judah's sin, Micah begins painting out a vivid future hope. He's been uh, decreeing judgment for three chapters, and now he, he points us to light. He will assemble and he will gather. That's what this says. And he's pointing back. He already said this in chapter 2. I will assemble you. I will gather the remnant. In that day, that future day, when when all the statues of human existence that weren't building God's kingdom, when all of those are toppled in the midst of judgment and God's justice, he says, I will rebuild. I will assemble the lame. You think about lame, unable to walk properly, physically broken on a, on a personal level. And what God's saying is for you, body parts restored, emotions restored to, to fullness, to the way that things ought to be. I will reassemble the lame. And he says, I will gather the scattered, those who I have afflicted through his judgment. And the lame will make a strong nation. So it's not just individual wholeness and fulfillment, but it's, it's all of God's people coming together. A people, not party lines, n- nor racial, nor, nor occupational, nor economic, nor age, nor family, demographic. None of those things of division. The broken will be restored and the severed will be reunited. And the Lord will reign over them from this time forevermore. For them, then and there, there was a judgment coming to the door of these people. But Micah breathes hope into that judgment for the remnant that would hold on, for the remnant that would walk with the Lord, for for the remnant that God would hold on to. This is the hope that they had, and it's the same hope that we get to cling to in our present 
pain and our present suffering that God continues to carry out justice perfectly as he does either in the now or in the future or in the past through the injustice of Christ on the cross. One day, God will restore the lame and he will regather those who have been cast out and his rule will reign forever and his presence will never cease, never, ever. So for us, as we think that hope cuts through judgment, when things are difficult, when there is real uh, future hope that cuts through the fray of the day and the weight of work and life and anxiety and fear and frustration. So, so when, when we're hanging on by a thread, the thread that brings hope is that God rules and that God is present. And, and one day, those two things will be the most present reality that shape every second of our eternity. Hope cuts through judgment. And the second thing that we see here is, is judgment brings pain. I'm reading verse 9 and 10. Now why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in you? Has your counselor perished? That pain seized you like a woman in labor, writhe and groan, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in labor, for now you shall go out from the city and dwell in the open country. You shall go to Babylon. And, and to Babylon, they, they will go. A century plus later. And then he says, there you shall be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you from the land of your enemies. So God's people have forsaken him. They are they're sleeping with wickedness, and God judges the wicked. And, and you might have in your mind an idea of what that looks like. And, and what the scriptures teach us is that is that is us apart from grace that God has given us. Paul the Apostle says it this way: He says, I am chief of sinners. So we get, to, we get to start there, that apart from, from God's grace to us, this is our end. So that one day of hope, that one day in the future when, when the remnant is, is uh, united back together and, and, and restored, that's a ways off. It's a ways off for these people. And so he says to them, have you no king? No ruler, no stability, no leader, no one to direct you, no one to reign over the citizens, no one to protect and provide for you. Have you no king? Have you no counselor? Have you no one to care for you? No one to redirect your wayward thoughts back to thoughts that are true? No one to bear with you? No one to help restore the hope within you? Imagine that. No one to bring order to the world around you. No one to bring order to the chaos within you. There is pain inside and out. What this text tells us is this pain is, is from God, for God's wayward people. That he will bring judgment to them because he is just and he destroys the wicked, and he disciplines his own. They will be thrown out of the city, and they will live in the country, and they will be taken into Babylon. And the analogy that he uses is, is gut-wrenching pain, childbirth. You, you may or may not know this, but I've never experienced uh, childbirth. I've never experienced a, a baby coming out of me. Um, I've never even had a kidney stone, right? Matt Tucker, wherever you are, there you are. Um, I, I've not experienced anything like that, nor do I ever want to experience anything like that. I, I can't imagine. And, and having a child today, I, I've been in the room when a couple came into this world, and whether they're, they're cut from you or, or they, they come out in a more natural, in completely unnatural way, there is pain. There is no, there is no, th this is not a cakewalk, but can you imagine 
the original hearers understanding childbirth 3,000 years ago? Can you imagine the pain that came along with that? The screaming and the, the, the discomfort and, and the fear and the anguish and the, the terror and, and just the sheer pain? He says, for now you will go out from the city, but there, in your pain, you will be rescued. There, the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. And it is difficult to, for us to connect with realities, and, and certainly a, a book like this, a minor prophet, and it's difficult for us to get there and figure out what's going on. It's difficult to apply these truths, but, but it isn't a stretch to see that God is pointing us to this reality. In this life, there will be pain. And in this life, there will be suffering. But take heart, I will and I have overcome the world. And I will rescue you from that pain. The reason why there is pain and judgment is to bring justice to pain delivered through sin. And, and, and for them even though it, it, it may have taken generations, um, his people will be rescued and the remnant will be reestablished. And we have the same hope and, and we have a fuller picture of what that rescue looks like. Do you know that, that for those who would turn from sin, even today, for those who walk um, in opposition to God, this judgment is your end. But for those who turn to the Lord, for those who trust Jesus to have taken on this punishment, taken on the wrath of God, taken on the, the injustice of God, for those who trust Jesus and walk with him, that judgment for sin has already been poured out on another who has taken our injustice to set us free. That's what we get to hope in today. Not the works of our hands, but the work of another. God's people will endure pain. But through the pain is the hope of God's plan. And the third thing we see is this. Pain gives way to gain. Let me begin in verse 11. Now many nations are assembled against you, saying, Let her be defiled. And let our eyes gaze upon Zion. So, so what they're saying is, we want to rule the holy city. Give us this city of yours. It, it, it's ours to take. And so the nations around God's people are, are closing in on them. And they, they feel that. And they feel uh, tribes and kingdoms from the north beginning to, to invade uh, Israel to the north and, and, and that uh, the, the capital city Samaria begin to fall and, and, and we saw in the beginning of chapter 1 that, that they're knocking at the gate to the south, Jerusalem and so Micah is saying they're coming the judgment is coming for you so the nations assemble against you and they say let her be defiled and we see a picture of this reality in Jesus he was God in the flesh he was the temple Mount. He was, was, was God in human form, ruling and reigning and dwelling among us and the people around him. They wanted no part. They wanted to crucify him and kill him. Let him be defiled. So they put up the sign, King of the Jews, to mock him. If you're the Son of God, take yourself off of the cross. But what he knew was... His plan was God's plan, and, and he knew that he endured suffering, and he endured pain, and he endured the judgment of the justice of God so that we might gain from his work. So as we read on in verse 12, but they do not know the thoughts of the Lord. They do not understand his plan, that he has gathered them as sheaves to the threshing floor. And I know you guys are like, wow, that's incredible. 
What is a sheave? And what is a threshing floor? Imagine a, a, a stone circle 20 or 30 feet in diameter. And imagine heaps and heaps of, of grain that have been gathered and, and harvested and, and just thrown in the middle. And imagine oxen and, and donkeys and, and other animals just, just walking all over that, that grain and that, that wheat. Imagine some of them pulling sleds behind them and, and uh, the, the, essentially the farmers, those leading in the agriculture would be standing on those little sleds that had rough bottoms on them and, and they're just going over and over and over the grain and some are heaping more into it. And as the, as the grain gets threshed, as the wheat gets threshed on the threshing floor, another comes and he picks it up with a big basket and he tosses it into the air. And the, the stuff that's irrelevant, the stuff that doesn't matter, the stuff that, that the, the stem and the stalk, the stuff that they don't need to make the things that they, they eat, it's blown away as chaff in the wind. As they throw it up, it's gone, but what remains is the good grain. And over and over again, they do this. So that's the picture. But they do not know the thoughts of the Lord, that they do not understand that those wicked who are coming against my people... He has gathered them as sheaves to the threshing floor. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make your horn iron and I will make your hooves bronze. You shall beat in places many peoples and shall devote their gain to the Lord, their wealth to the Lord of the whole earth. See, there is pain in childbirth. But when all goes well, on the other side of the incredible pain of labor, a child. And regardless of, of what the culture might say or of what your own experience or, or, or your even current situation at home with maybe kids running around or whatever, right? Regardless of those things, children are a blessing from the Lord. That's what the Bible teaches. They bring joy and delight, and they, they sharpen and they shape. And some of the sweetest times of my life are, are with just getting to see my kids be my kids. Can you imagine a, a baby's giggle just for a second? We've all seen that. Just You rub their, their tiny little tootsies, right? And they just giggle and laugh. And, and like, who's going to look at that and think, oh, this is terrible? Nobody's going to do that. Or, or uh, my kids, they're, they're 11 and 12, and uh, sometimes, you know, Google Photos reminder comes up of, of years gone by when they were tiny little kids, and, and, and one of them came up recently, and it was Ireland, my daughter, and, and she's just crying, and, and I wasn't there. I was at work, and, and Kim was getting video of her, and she just kept saying, I want my daddy. I miss my daddy. Just through the tears, I miss my daddy. And I'm looking at that, you know, like, like this week, and I'm just like <laughs> welling up because I'm like, I, I miss you too, babe. Or my son who is uh, internet famous, there's a video on YouTube somewhere out there of him just blowing spit bubbles for like two minutes, right? And I thought it was a good idea to like record that. How beautiful that is, just to see this tiny little baby just can't even uh, take care of himself in any way, shape, or form, but he, but he found it in him to make spit bubbles, and it was the cutest thing ever. Or when I walk around West Side Little League, because we're there like every day of the week, and, and baseball and, and softball, uh, because those are the most important things in the world, Right? Um, and that's what you would think if you're walking around West Side Little League, except for on one field, when everybody walks by, minus the coaches, everyone smiles. You know why? Because the kids are tiny. They're this big, and they're, they're hitting balls off of a tee, and their, their pants are this big, and they're huge on them. And it's the cutest thing, and everybody who walks by that field, they smile, and they look, and they point, and they laugh. Because kids are a blessing. And they're such a blessing that after the pain, the incredible joy of new life fills heart and home. Again, it, it's, it's no cakewalk, but what a gift and joy. And so much is the gift of, of, of a child 
that women regularly position themselves to be put right back into that situation. They willingly bring the pain upon themselves again, sometimes repeatedly because of the gain that breaches forth through that incredible pain. And and simply what God is telling his people of old, along with you and me today, is similar. There will be pain. Pain will exist because the world is held captive by sin. And those those freed from that sin uh, and its demand and its penalty, even they fall back into its grip and its influence. And God brings justice to sin and its wage. But that pain won't last for those who are in Christ. And as I'm reading this... And he's talking about the the horn made of iron and the hooves of bronze. I'm thinking of that great uh, WWF fighter, the ultimate warrior, who would be being destroyed, right? He's just getting pummeled the whole match. And suddenly, what starts happening? His leg starts twitching, right? And he's near the rope, and he starts shaking the rope. and, And the guy behind him is just hitting him in the back or whatever, but it doesn't matter. And when that happens... When the ultimate warrior's leg starts twitching, it's over, right? None can stand against him. The ultimate warrior is the king of reversals. But they do not know the thoughts of the Lord. They do not understand his plan that he has gathered them as sheaves to the threshing floor. They don't know who's you are. They don't know who I am. And I can almost feel the crowds roar as Micah delivers this hope. And, and the leg shakes and strength comes upon him. And this is not strength that he's speaking of, God's people, that, that you get from the weight room, but it's supernatural strength. Those who have come to judge and bring justice, they won't know what's hitting them. The pain you endure in the broken parts of this life, but a distant memory and the joy you find in in the micro slivers of this life are but a taste of future hope and future glory. God's people will be part of threshing the wicked. And all of this, once through God rebuilding the temple and restoring Jerusalem, only to have it toppled once again, and and for all when he brings the new heaven and the new earth down to this one. Years ago, I preached a a sermon on future things, and I said as a point of application that that we get to leave our heart in heaven and live to meet it there. That's what this points us to. That's what, that's what hope leads us to do, not to disengage because of the future hope that we have, but to engage all the more, to invite others into this escape of judgment and into this kingdom building of future glory through Jesus. I close out by giving you a contrast of two hopes. Beginning in 1821, the city of London was overrun with reports of a previously unknown nation nestled on the Caribbean coastline of what is now Honduras. It was called Poyas. It was supposedly a lush and untapped paradise of fertile farmland, rolling hills, and gold-rich streams. Its native Poyers were described as a friendly and hardworking people in its capital. St. Joseph was a European-style settlement dotted with public buildings and even an opera house. Poyas boasted a deep water port, a pleasant climate that made it immune to the scourge of tropical disease. It was, it was as one guidebook claimed, one of the most healthy and beautiful spots in the world. It was the land flowing with milk and honey. It was the great escape for the the Europeans. It was a complete and total fraud. It was a sham. Uh, A con artist named Gregor McGregor, which you knew something was off, um, he, 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 was, uh, he took thousands and thousands of dollars in the late 1800s from investors. 
He shipped people there by the hundreds, only to have them get off of the ship and find uninhabitable jungle that was disease-ridden. It was not the life that they hoped for. It was a diseased disappointment. And by the time it finally ran its course, several years later, he had duped scores of unsuspecting investors, thousands upon thousands, and had led to at least 150 people dying. When your hope through pain is anything that this world offers, this is your end. This is your hope. It, it will be melted and it will be nothing. But when we get to the shoreline of our future hope, we will not be disappointed. For those who, who understand the God of this book, for those that get to trust Jesus to give them life eternal here and forever, we get to have not a sham, not a disappointment, but life that, that shatters even our wildest dreams of the goodness that will follow those who are the Lord's. God's people will endure pain, but through the pain is the hope of God's plan. And I just want to close out by reading this passage in Revelation once again as the band comes up. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Father, thank you for the gift of this future hope. Would you let it sink into our heads and our hearts so we suffer pain in this life, and as by your grace we escape the pain of your judgment by the work of Jesus. God, would you let us be people who invite people into that escape? Would you let us be people who, who don't just withdraw from this life, but who engage because of the hope that sits before us? We pray these things by the power of the Spirit in the name of Jesus. Amen.